Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andre Holland, Mr. Tim Raw, Carmen Ijogo, Common, Mr. Tom Wilkinson. <laughs> Please let me introduce Miss Dee Dee Gardner, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey, Ava DuVernay, <laughs> David Oyelowo, <laughs> and Mr. Jeremy Kleiner. Hi, everybody. My name is Smokey Fontaine. I'm our moderator this afternoon, and my job is going to be to get out of the way and let this phenomenal cast and crew speak to what I think we all can agree on is an exquisite film about American history, an exquisite portrait of one of the icons of American life, and, and really one of the most beautiful pieces of work I've seen in, in such a long time. So first, congratulations to Ava and to everyone here on the work that you've done with Selma. Please. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to jump right in. Ava, I'd, I'd love to start with you. Tell us, please, from a director's position, how you struck the balance between a responsibility to history, if you will, a responsibility to a true story, and the creative kind of narrative that you wanted to tell uh, in this film. Yes, well, thanks. thank you all for being here. It's good to see everybody. Um, I think none, no one here wanted to make a film about a statue or a speech or a sale or a street name or initials or a catchphrase or all the things that I feel King has been reduced to in a lot of ways. He was a dynamic, charismatic, uh, you know, brilliant mind. He was a man of faith who was sometimes unfaithful. He was guilty. He was depressed. He had an ego. He liked to laugh. He was a prankster. He was a human being. And uh, there hasn't been a film made with Dr. King at the center released by a studio ever. And so when we were charged to do it, um, you know, our main goal was to show him in all of his human complexity and kind of unlock him from the statue and let him live and breathe and, um, and tell the story through that lens. David, speaking of unlocking him from the statue, you were given the task of, of doing that and translating that statue into real life. Please tell us about your process. When we look at you now, obviously the transformation was dramatic from who you are in real life to who you played on screen, David. <laughs> Talk to us, if you will, about the creative process you undertook. Well, uh, you know, Dr. King did not think of himself as an icon. He didn't walk around thinking of himself as a historical figure. He was a man. And, um, you know, I am so full of admiration in terms of what he did. Um, and I am not him. But the thing that I could uh, seize upon was he was a father of four, as I am. He was a Christian, as I am. He was someone who valued justice, as I do. And those were my entry points. Um, one of the most valuable um, sources I had for finding him was Andrew Young. I spent a lot of time with Ambassador Young, and he talked to me about his friend. He talked to me, as Ava just mentioned, he talked to me about the prankster, the father, uh, the man who was at times unsure. Um, and that, that was the foundation on which I had to build. Of course, as an actor, you have to do the technical things, you know, the weight gain and and also, you know what, one of the amazing things for me was the journey I went through uh, in, in order to get to this place. I had the privilege of being in films like Lincoln, in which I played a Unionist soldier. I, I, I played a preacher in The Help. I played a black fighter pilot in Red Tails. I played the son of a butler in The Butler, um, and who was in the sit-ins, in the Freedom Rides, became uh, a Black Panther. You know, all these things uh, also went into uh, this portrayal. So I kind of feel like in the seven years since I read the script, I was on this journey towards this, and, and now it culminated in the right people coming together to make the film. I have to give such credit to Jeremy and Dee Dee for sticking with the project for eight years. A lot of producers, considering how many false starts we had, would have maybe shelved the project. They didn't. Um, and so, you know, the right people, as I say, came together to support me in, in, in doing what I did. Speaking of the right person, Oprah Winfrey, I, I want to talk to you so much about your motivating force behind this film as a producer but you also decided to, to give us your creative talent to this film. Why did you choose to, to play a role 
in front of the camera as well as behind the scenes. Because Ava made me do it. <laughs> Ava made me do it. Um, Ava sent me uh, uh, an online piece regarding the real Annie Lee Cooper uh, that was from a Selma newspaper when she celebrated her 100th birthday in 2010. And in that piece, it uh, uh, talked about her life and uh, her memories of um, that, that time in, in Selma where she um, actually knocked out uh, Sheriff, she had the fight with Sheriff uh, Clark. And at the end of the piece, it said every day, now she watched the Oprah show at four o'clock <laughs> with a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> and uh, she did that on purpose. And Ava said, don't you think it would mean a lot to her to know? <laughs> that you, who she watched every day at four o'clock with the tuna fish sandwich, uh, was, was portraying her. And, and that was it, because I'd said, no, no, every film I've been in, I end up hitting somebody. My last movie, I you know, had to slap David. Uh, <laughs> and I said, I want to do another film where I'm knocking somebody out or I'm having a fight and so <laughs> forth. But that, it, it, it really happened, and it happened that, you know, there, there's a famous photograph of her being pinned down by the two uh, deputy sheriffs. Uh, and so I said yes for Annie Lee Cooper and the tuna fish sandwich and watching the Oprah show every day, but more importantly, for every other woman and man in my history who took that walk to the registrar's office and was turned down and then went back home and tried it another year and then went back and tried it another year. This was Annie Lee Cooper's fifth time and um, when you think about what it takes to keep getting up and saying, I will and I can, in the face of an entire society that says that you cannot and you will not, um, I, I just wanted to be able to take the few minutes in that walk and, and, and uh, pay tribute to all of those people. That's why I said yes. Jeremy, Didi, there, there are always so many stories behind the scenes that when, when we learn of them, they were so <coughs> critical to a film being made, and we've spoken about the power of what this film means today. Can you share with us some of the stories as to, or one key story as to how this film came to be now in this moment when it took so many years to come to life? Jeremy, I'll start with you. You know, uh, it, it did have a long history, uh, as you've mentioned, but, you know, I, I, my kind of uh, vantage point is really uh, the moment where we met Ava and her kind of incredible uh, vision and the different qualities that made her the perfect filmmaker. Um, that's kind of the, the moment I remember where, where we looked at each other and um, after a number of false starts, it felt like, wait, this, this actually, this is gonna come to pass, this film. Um, <clears throat> well. It has nothing to do with me, which are usually the best stories. Um, I think the, the most extraordinary moment is, is the one that David tells about sitting on an airplane next to someone who was reading Ava's script from Middle of Nowhere and wondering if he should invest in it. And David reading the script in that moment and then calling Ava and introducing himself and saying, I want to be in your movie. <laughs> the fact that that happened and we're here... Like, that's the coolest part of the film business, I think. Just the really circuitous and strange way that curiosity and art can have uh, staying power. We're going to open this up to questions in a moment, but I'm going to go to the back row. Just, there's a two mics that should be roving, so if you uh, have a question, just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. But let me please go to this back row. Miss Carmen, uh, such a beautiful performance as Coretta Scott King. Um, this was not the first time you played Mrs. King. Can you tell us about what you brought to the role and how potentially you learned from your first portrayal into your second? Sure. Um, well, I think I was excited to explore the character for a second time, um, which I can't think of any other actor that's got the chance to do that, to explore the same character at a different part of their life. Um, I think what excited me about doing it again was that it was a very different take and she's a very different woman at this point. Um, she, there's, a, there's a burden, there's a weariness. Um, the, the marriage is in a very different space. And I think Ava's intention to not 
explore the iconography of these people and the, the mythology and to sort of get behind the curtain and to deconstruct the mythology was what was most intriguing to me. You know, I'm really excited by characters that have an external life that maybe doesn't match up to the internal. And I feel like Coretta is very much that person. I remember watching an episode of Oprah while I was in U the UK of a makeover of Coretta. Lord. Yeah, and I, it stuck with me because I rem and I didn't really know who Coretta was at that point. I was just a girl in the UK watching your show. And I remember, though, very vividly being so struck by a woman who still had a hairstyle and a makeup that was sort of stuck in time to some degree, that she was really holding on to a moment in time that she, that she felt in some ways beholden to. And, and then you did a great job and you made her look so different. And there was a whole other life that came out in her in that moment. And then the next day she went back to being what I we expected of her. I even sent a hairdresser to Atlanta to try to keep her hair looking like that. <laughs> and she wouldn't, she wouldn't, she couldn't accept she it. She couldn't do it. And I think it. part of that was really interesting to me. A woman that had so much vitality and she was an academic and an intellectual and an artist and a singer. And that somehow she felt that those things had to be somewhat suppressed for the, bet for the betterment of the movement, for the sake of the marriage, for the sake of being the mother to her children. That was so heroic to me in so many ways, but the opportunity to ex explore and to reveal those parts in her in some small way, and I feel like the brilliant scene that Ava wrote in the center of the film, where you get to see her finally being powerful and vulnerable and, and, and frustrated and all of these dynamics, for the first time, for me on film, I think you get to see a far more multi-layered woman than, um, than I got to play in 1955 in, in Boycott, for example. So that's why I wanted to do it. Ava, how challenging is that for you to, to have added so many layers to a story which could have been told as a cradle to a grave, could have been told as I have a dream, and so much built-in drama for the Voting Rights Act, but you devoted so much time on the screen to, to what we've been talking about, the, the love story and the personal story. A risk for you as a filmmaker to do that or? No, I mean, a risk for me as a filmmaker to make a film that feels like medicine and spinach and, you know, I mean, you know, we're on the other side of it now, so uh, it feels good, but facing the, the, the idea of, of making a film about Dr. King, it's like, how do you do that? Like, what, what do you do to make that feel urgent and vital and, and, and immediate and, and not like a dusty history book. And so, I mean, the ways you do it is, is, is you, it's, you focus on story and character. And in order to focus on story and character, you have to be telling the truth about people. And that's the only way to do that, to make this not be an after-school special type of, of thing that I don't think anyone here was interested in doing. Um, I don't think, you know, um, a, a kind of a standard script approaching this material would have attracted the caliber of, of the cast or our collaborators collaborators, our department heads, all of the creatives that worked on this, such such geniuses at what they do. So it wasn't a risk, it was the only thing to be done, I think. Yeah. Tom Wilkinson, your character has been often portrayed, <laughs> sir. <laughs> right? As Mr. Uh, President LBJ. Thank you. So you uh, had a lot to draw from in terms of prior performances, but there was a side to your character that was also more personal. Can you describe describe that? I hadn't watched any other portrayals of President Johnson, I don't think I... Oh, there have been a few. Yes, I remember them, yes. <laughs> By English guys, or By almost. English, yeah, oddly correct. enough. There but I didn't, I didn't really remember them, so I didn't really do an awful lot of research into the guy. Well, I, I wanted a sense of him. I wasn't going to do an impersonation. I wanted a sense of, of, of him. And that's a sort of... Just so that, intuitively, you knew when you were sort of doing the right thing. Um, have I answered your question at all? You have. <laughs> yes, you have. That, we'll that's start. it, I think. Uh. <coughs> um, for the cast and also the director, there were a lot of um, really dark moments. Obviously, this is really heavy material to work with, and I can only imagine that as actors and directors and producers, you're taking a lot of it home with you. Um, what were some of the ways that you coped with the... Um, dark characters that you were dealing with. Should we uh, open that up to some of our colleagues? Why don't we go with Maybe our Tim? dark, darkest Roth. character on the <laughs> panel, Mr. Roth. Mr. Tim Roth. Tim Roth. Uh, well, I, I got that one. Um, <laughs> I went to, uh, I, my, me and my dad was a, a full-on lefty 
an American man, went to England and uh, fought for the British in the Second World War. And when we were kids, and my mum too, was a full-on lefty. So when we were kids, we were taken to uh, demonstrations and we were uh, throw, you know, throwing stones at skinheads and stuff. And uh, we, we were brought up that way uh, to be active and to be socially active. And King was, a, was a, a, a presence in our house, as was Wallace. And um, Wallace was an, a monstrous uh, human being when we were kids. We were, it was a very flat, two-dimensional kind of animal. And someone to loathe for you know, good reason. Um, but then when she came to me, when Ava came to me to have a go at this, I, I, what am I supposed to do? You've got to try and get a three-dimensional uh, walking sort of bag of bones. You've got to get that up and running. So I had to try and find some kind of humanity, something that I could latch onto. And one thing I did, which is kind of similar to what David was talking about, was I, I looked at footage of him. There's the, the obvious stuff, you know, that we all know and love. And then, but there was, there was a piece where his son was talking about him, and his son was talking about him in a very different way. And I grabbed onto that. I grabbed onto that. So I could find a little bit of humanity to thread in the limited amount of space that we had to deal with this guy. And kind of threw that at the screen a little bit. But he's horrible, <laughs> which is fun. But um, we laughed a lot. Yeah, we, we, we really laughed. laughed. We laughed a lot. I mean, the more racist I was, the more she laughed. <laughs> 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 Y'all okay. have created all of you a masterpiece, um, Oscar Buzz, all the way. This film, I think, it looks at his, how important knowing your history is, and I really think a lot of young people today uh, are kind of far removed from that era. They, they, like, for example, Oprah on your master class, uh, I remember Cicely Tyson said she asked a 13-year-old about Martin Luther King, and she said, who's Martin Luther King? So I would like to know from you, how important is history, knowing your history mm. to you? Yeah, it's very important. You already know the answer to the question because you're asking <laughs> it. I think you don't know yourself and you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've come from. And Maya Angelou has a wonderful poem. It's called um, To Our Grandmothers. And in that she says, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. And I've been in multiple meetings where I was the single woman and the single black person within a 50 mile radius. But I step into that room as one and I come with 10,000 and 10,000 and 10,000 at my back and my sides. And knowing that means I can go anywhere, I can do anything because I recognize where I've come from and what I've come from. So the Annie Lee Coopers of the world, whose names a lot of people didn't make the history books and aren't as known as Dr. King and John Lewis and all the others, um, were equally important in, their, in the courage that they demonstrated daily to stand, in, stand inside and stand up for themselves. And I think that there is no greater, when you understand your history, you understand you. We have a question. Start to you. Thank you very much. This very important movie comes at, I think, the most important time. Um, as we saw tens of thousands of marchers yesterday in this city and in cities around the country, it almost seems like it could have been a scene from this film um, in terms of, of an outcry for human decency. Oprah, Ava, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. <coughs> Well, I think it's um, it is a, a jaw-dropping thing that this piece of art can can meet this cultural moment that's so rich, that's so robust, that's so bursting with with energy of of, of people amplifying their voices. This film is about voice. This film is about being heard. Um, you know, we're sitting here in this hotel doing interviews about how these marches changed the nation. While I hear people marching outside, one of the things about making a film like this, a film about history, as a filmmaker, that you fear is how do you make it immediate? How do you make it relevant. textural, relevant, something that people can see themselves in? But we are experiencing these very things right now. And the thought of that, that the, the timing, although this film took a long time to get made, although um, you know, we, once we were able to make it, we had to make it really quickly, 32 days to shoot and run, 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 that the timing. And a day and a half to shoot Bloody Sunday. A day and yes, a half. Yes. 
that the timing was all perfect. Like you always tell me, um, it was exactly what it should be. And I feel like this, mo this film, not to overstate it, but it is here for a reason in this moment. And we just hope, I think, that it can add to the conversation, to the energy that's going on. Um, what a vibrant time, I mean, in our adult lives to be able to see this kind of, you know, nation galvanize around these issues. <laughs> I think it's very exciting. Common, yeah. speak to us, please, about, about relevance. You are a hip-hop artist by trade, an artist of, of many different kinds, and you were on a march just yesterday and, and the day before, but talk to us about what you brought to the role and what it means to you to be in such a film. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful honor to be a part of Selma because as a kid, I, I think the first person that I read about and came across that, that black people and white people both recognized as a as a hero was Dr. Martin Luther King and he was always somebody I really like looked up to and it became a point in my life where you know I became real Malcolm X's and it was like I don't know Martin may be soft but you know as I grew and, and evolved as a human being I realized that this, this peaceful protest is is, is one of the strongest things you can do and the strength that it took to do that. Um, me being involved in Selma, like taught me that it was, it was women, it was men, it was children. It was a spirit that, that said, we want freedom, we want justice. And, and a lot of people contributed to that. You know, because it, originally I was like, man, it's Martin Luther King, you know it's Martin Luther King. But to, to get to, meet the everyday people. Some people, we don't know their names. Yeah, we, we do know of the, the, the Annie Lee Coopers and we do know of the C.T. Vivians, but it's some people like, we, I had a journalist yesterday talk to us about her uncle who was out marching and we, we, we don't know his name, but everybody contributed. And what this film did was make me realize that we all have a part in contributing towards making the world better. So it's like me being a this was like a life-changing experience for me because I felt I could do more, you know, just being able to be James Bevel and be around Ava and be around the cast and the people that we worked with. I was like, I have to do more. I mean, learning about what they did, I got to do more. And now we, people are out there doing more and, and we want to do more. So I'm just grateful to, to be a part of it and the revolution is here. <laughs> Thank you. We have a, a question here. Purple sweater. Purple sweater here. Uh, wonderful mm. film. Mm. Quick question. A lot of people are going to draw parallels, of course, uh, to what happened then and what's happening now. Talk to me a little bit about that three-step uh, strategy that the SCLC uh, had that uh, Dr. King's character said. It was three steps. I can't recall exactly. Do you think that strategy should still play to what we're experiencing today? And I'm sorry that I can't recall the three steps. I know you know, though, David. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, I do. Um, well, I think that the, the, the parallels that I can see uh, in terms of Selma and Ferguson is uh, in the same way that in, in Ferguson, v w when it was voting rights that was being asked for, it was a black problem. Um, once Bloody Sunday happened and the, the country saw those images, it became an American problem. I think with Ferguson, when it was about Ferguson, it was a black problem. When the country saw the injustice of what happened to Eric Garner, it became an American problem. And that was the point beyond which black and white came together and these marches really gained momentum. Um, and in that instance, in, in, uh, in, in Selma, the, the problem was voting rights and there was federal intervention because what you had is a situation whereby, for one of a better phrase, the game was rigged. You know, as, as a black person, if you got killed and someone was brought on trial, they most likely would get off because it was a white jury of their peers. Uh, you know, we have a situation now where uh, what we need is police reform and the game is rigged again because there is a conflict of interest if it's local prosecutors and the police. So I would say we need federal intervention again, but also we just need to focus in what are the demands. Um, my fear at the moment is we have this amazing 
a slew of protests, but we don't have someone like Dr. King articulating what it is we want, what it is we need. A clear intention. A clear intention. Um, and that's not to say that we need a Dr. King in order to do that, but what I hope Selma shows and what is clearly needed is that clear intention. <laughs> what are we asking for? How are we going to ask for it in a tactical, politically savvy way? And I really hope and pray that our film in some ways shows what was effective in the past and how we can be effective going forward. Andre Holland, I want to bring you into this conversation. You play Andrew Young, sir. Um, there was a camaraderie and, and just a spirit of kind of friendship and kinship between Andrew and, and Dr. King and, and, and kind of his boys, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Just the kind of crew that was putting this all together and going through the South. Talk about that feeling kind of on set or, or just how you were able to capture that and, and bring that to the screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think, you know, jumping on what David just said, you know, one of the things I found most sort of remarkable about this experience was learning that there were so many people who were leaders in their own right, Andrew Young, John Lewis, Bevel, so many of them who had been incredible leaders, you know. And I think that that same sort of feeling of, of camaraderie did extend to our set. And there were these moments of magic that I think happened during the filming of this process, one of which for me, you know, having having been ra born and raised in Birmingham and, and growing up very near 16th Street Church. My family actually ran a funeral home that's right across the street from 16th Street Church. And, and my, my uncle used to always tell me stories about that time, you know, Kelly Ingram Park. And, and one of the stories he told me was about, um, one of many, was about a, a, a white man named Lamar Weaver who had been protesting and, and, and helping with the movement. And one night was chased through the streets all around Kelly Ingram Park and ended up at the doorstep of the Poole Funeral Chapel. And in order to keep him from being killed, my uncle Ernest brought him in the funeral home and hid him in a casket in the back so that they couldn't find him. And those kind of stories to me were magical, you know? And the fact that we got to bring these people to life, you know, not just the ones who everyone knows, but the ones who people know less about, but also played such an, an instrumental part to me was, was probably the most special part of the entire experience. Thank you, sir. Hi, um, my name is Rakia. I'm here with Black Enterprise. My question is for Ms. Winfrey. We, we all have moments in life where, you know, we meet someone and we sort of know that that person is special. You know, it's, it's like this moment where you might go tell your friends or it sort of connects for you and you know that this person is a game changer. They're going to do something amazing. What was that moment for you? We can call it an aha moment with Ava where you knew that this was a, a history maker, a visionary, she was it. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for giving me that question. Um, actually, I had that moment first with David Oyelowo. David and I were in the trailer doing um, Butler, and David handed me the tape of, uh, he said, I did this little film. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she always makes me sound like Oliver Twist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I looked at the tape. I Googled Ava. I saw that she was an African-American woman director and read a little bit of her history. And I emailed her, got her email address from David. Did I call you up? I didn't call you up. You called me up. I did? Yeah. I called. I emailed you first and said, we're going to be friends. Yes. And then I called her up and told her, <laughs> we're going to be. You emailed me and said, we're going to be friends. Yeah, and I emailed, called, emailed and said, we're going to be friends. Please send me your phone number so I can call like in, you. Like in the subject line. We're going to be friends. <laughs> we're going to be friends. And send me your phone number. And I could, I could feel from her countenance, from her, her, the spirit of her, that there was something inside her that I also had inside me. I could see that in David, and it's why I befriended David on the butler. And I could feel the same thing in Ava. And I think that part of my um, uh, trajectory here on the planet has been to try to inspire and lift other people up. So when I saw that here was somebody who has that thing, that it thing, I wanted to do everything in my power to lift that up, to bring light to that, to bring attention to that. And so that's why it happened. And now we're just buds. We're just <laughs> real buds. Yeah, really. We'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the, the beauty of this film and the cinematography and the art Thank direction and, and some of those choices. Bradford Please, Young. Yeah. Round of applause for Mr. Bradford Young, our Bradford cinematographer. Young.
and, and Ava, you can speak to this, and, and Carmen even as well. I mean, two, two scenes that stick out for, for me is the opening scene when, you know, uh, Carmen, you and David are just, you're, you're getting him ready to go to, to the Nobel Peace Prize and fixing his tie and having Love it. just an intimate conversation. I mean, a beautiful way to open, open the film, and it, it looks so, so real and, and emotional before we even had met the characters. Carmen? And Dr. King has some swag in that. Doesn't he does. Doesn't he have a little <laughs> zhuzh in there, you uh, think? Oh, and Dr. So your King question got some is, <laughs> And so your question is? Just the idea of uh, how were you able to, to <laughs> help you know, uh, articulate that kind of beauty and, and the, the, the being able to have lines that were about being a wife and being in love because it was, was not easy for Coretta Scott King in, in this relationship with, with such an individual as, as Martin was and the mission that he was on. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, how to retain the the elegance and the regalness that we have come to associate with Coretta, despite the, the cracks, <laughs> the sensual, yeah, the sexy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think David and I had always intended to make these people as, as authentic as a couple as possible, and that includes sensuality, that includes, that includes touching, that includes being intimate, and even if we haven't seen it before, I don't think in any way we felt we were doing a disservice to the, to the legacy or to the to the heroism of these people by showing that they had human desires and human elements to them. In fact, I felt very strongly that we were doing them an absolute service by showing that they had the same desires and wants and frailties and foibles and doubts as the rest of us because to then be able to achieve the, the things that they did despite the fact that they are as human as the rest of us makes them even more aspirational to me. Um, so I was... It was an absolute privilege to to flesh them out and to make them desirous of flesh and, and all of those things that a, a married couple are. Thank you. We had a question here. Uh, Ma'am in the front, yes. Uh, Selma's emotionally riveting and it, it grabs you and uh, the times today, our, our contemporary times are emotionally riveting also and if Ferguson and if Eric Gardner hadn't happened and this film was still released today, what would your, the parallels that you're drawing, to, that people are drawing to those situations and, and Selma, are, what would they be if, if those two things hadn't happened and what would you want the message to be of the film today? Well, I mean, you know, uh, uh, distressed race relations in this country is ambient. It's not just happening because of these two things. So when we were making the film, I mean, it's part of the atmosphere of, of, of this country. I certainly feel that as a, as a person of color. So, you know, these incidences are amplifying that in a, in, a, in a very specific way where it's feeling like it's very much at the forefront of what everyone's thinking about. But as a person of color in this country, I think about that all the time when my brothers walk out of the house and I hope that they come back. And that's just always there so um so yes this is this is a beautiful time where where we're able to kind of um you know uh, uh, there's a magnifying glass on it um but it certainly i don't think would have been entirely different if these events hadn't happened and um, what was top of mind for me while making the film was <laughs> the voting rights act um that was all we were we were thinking about and talking about early on um i really thought that that would be a big topic of conversation as we presented the film you know the dismantling of the very act that we are chronicling its creation in the film, um, the, 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 the violence to that act that has happened and is hard to, to put back together. Um, so there's so much going on um, within the film that it's not all specific to, to Ferguson, I don't think. Um, and, and hopefully, I mean, that's what art does. It continues to illuminate things as, as the years go on. What we will see in this film, Selma, hopefully if people are watching it 10 years from now, is something that we probably haven't even thought of yet. I don't know if that answers your question, but. We'll go here on the side, Chuck. Hi, everybody. A uh, great film. I, I really loved it. Um, I'm Chuck Kriegmer from allhiphop.com. So I have a, a quick two-piece question for Ava and, and Oprah. Um, for Ava, or rather for Oprah, I should say, um, how do we continue to get these types of engaging programs, not only in film, but also in TV, like, like the 90s or maybe the 80s, if that makes any sense to you? And um, my question for Ava is, have you gotten any response from the King family? Yes. 
And what is that response? You want to switch? Switch question. Yeah, yeah. The eight, you, you out know. of the 80s or the 90s? Yeah, okay, you do that. You mean, you mean, <laughs> you, you, you mean, you mean 80s and the 90s when there was a, an abundance of films yeah, like, about, exactly. centered on black life or not an abundance, but more? That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes, yes, I understand. Um, yes, I mean, uh, I, I, I think, I think, uh, you know. Well, black artists and, and black cinematic artists have been making those films. They, you know, it, it really is that the, that there's a certain gaze on them now. Um, I think, you know, that there's some of them that have kind of, um, I won't even say risen. There's some that have had a spotlight placed on them. But I mean, as a black independent filmmaker, there's been a continuum of beautiful things made. There's been no drop off from the '80s to this time. The drop off has been who's watching them and paying them attention, right? And so I think now you have a, a resurgence of attention around some beautiful things, whether it be Fruitvale Station, 12 Years, and, and The Butler last year, or this year with Belle, with Beyond the Lights, with Dear White People. I mean, it, it's there, they're more coming next year, but they've always been. And so I think the charge is, is, to, is to make sure that they, that they remain in a place of consistency. And we talk a lot about black, but what about brown? What about indigenous? What about Asian? I mean, it, you know, it's, it's just, there's not enough diversity behind the camera. It's really about getting storytellers, giving the storytellers of all kinds the ability to, to, to let their voice be heard. That's my hope. Yes, we have heard from the Kings. Last weekend at, um, uh, in Santa Barbara, at my home, we had a celebration with all of the um, civil rights leaders who were actually a part of the film. John Lewis and Andrew Young and Julian Bond and... Um, Reverend Lowry and Diane Nash and all of them were, were there. And al along with Bernice King and Martin Luther King Jr. the third, they've seen the film now at least two times. Um, they're really impressed with Carmen. They think that Carmen uh, really depicted their mother beautifully and felt equally so about um, David's portrayal of Dr. King. Um, so they're pretty pleased with the film. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Danielle from HelloBeautiful.com. Ava named us. Yes, <laughs> yes. um, this question is for, as well, you and Oprah, kind of a double parter as well. Um, like your t-shirt. Thank yeah. you, peace, love, and Oprah. <laughs> Oprah t-shirt. <laughs> 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 <Thanks. laughs> mm. Very good, my Couldn't sister. Couldn't help but notice. Thank yeah. you. I was hoping you would, girl. That's why I did it. Um, so. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, Ava. Um, obviously, you you guys have spoke to this a lot. You make a lot of films that share a human experience. And it was really powerful to see that with Dr. King, seeing that he also needed people to pour into him for him to be the leader of this movement, which was very beautiful. How do you do that? How do you dig into a human experience of someone from our past that's mystified? Right. Mm. Um, I mean, you, you just have to really deconstruct all of the things that you think that you know about him and really look to the fact that this is a brother from Atlanta brother from Atlanta, father was a preacher, grandfather was a preacher, he didn't want to be a preacher. Went to Boston, fell in love with this fine sister, right? Beautiful sister, she was a little older than him, most people don't know that. They fell in love, she, he moves to Atlanta because he wants to, from Atlanta to Montgomery, wants to get away from his father, wants to have a little room to breathe and be his own man. Two seconds of him arriving there, he gets swept up by the local leaders. He's handsome, he can talk pretty well. Have him start talking about this bus boycott thing. Have him start to talk about what's going on with Mrs. Parks. And he gets swept up in history. That's the way we approach it as a person in their real life story as opposed to four words and being your, your whole life is reduced to four words, to I have a dream. I mean, what would any of us do if we were reduced to four words? He was so much more than that. And so that was my approach, is just to try to track his life and get underneath the meat of it. Well, and, and yeah. listen, Ava is brilliant because what you, I think you all probably recognize, we didn't have the uh, IP for this, and so we were not allowed to use any of his original speeches. And there were times where, you know, we needed an, another scene, and. Literally, the producers would be on the phone and said, Ava, can you write that this weekend? Can you go back and channel Dr. King and write that this weekend? Which she did. So every single word coming out of his mouth for those speeches, Ava, Ava, Ava wrote them. And, um, uh, and, and did it in such a way that in the end, Bernice King says to you. Uh, that it's, it's the uh, best interpretation of my father I've ever seen. Oh. There you go. Mm -hmm. 
David, I'll, I'll stay with you, and this may have to be the last word, but Sidney Poitier said he, he, chose, he chooses to do his work as a reflection of his values. Mm. Is this a project that you've chosen, sir, as a reflection of who you are? Yeah. Um, never before have I engaged in an artistic endeavor that so brings everything I am as a man together. Um, I'm a Christian myself. I have four children. Um, because of my faith, uh, sacrificial love, love in the face of injustice, these are the things I hold dear. Um, so, you know, as, as a man, as a storyteller, as a citizen of the world, you know, what you see when you watch Selma is, is everything I value and, and aspire to be. Uh, one of the things I, I was so glad that we showed, two of the things, was how humanity came together to, um, to fight this cause together. Black, white, people of several faiths coming together. I think that that's the most beautiful thing we do as human beings is coming together. I also feel as, as, as a man, one of the things I was so proud of with this film was Ava bringing to, to light the women in, in this film. Uh, I, I have a, a beautiful wife. I have an incredible daughter. I am a big fan of women. Um, and, um, you know, they were marginalized within this movement, even though it was a, a movement against injustice and inequality. They were just as brilliant, they were just as bright, they were just as courageous and tenacious. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I just feel one of the, the greatest blessings of my life was also seeing um, Ava and Oprah behind the monitor while we were shooting this thing. That, to me, is definitely a realization of Dr. King's dream. Um, this a beautiful black woman telling this story so beautifully. Um, this other beautiful black woman uh, helping us uh, get this story told. This wouldn't have happened 50 years ago uh, in terms of them uh, helping us get this done. And so, if this is one of, if not the greatest things I do with my life, I will be happy with that. Ladies and gentlemen, Selma opens in limited release on Christmas Day in New York and Los Angeles. It then goes wider on January the 9th. Our New York, Los Angeles, and we added new DC, cities, folks. You guys are getting new news. New we York, haven't said Los it Angeles before. Yes. Atlanta and DC as well. It's added as on Christmas. New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Washington, DC on Christmas Day, wider January 9th. The hashtag is March On. I'd like to please thank Andre Holland, Tim Roth. Carmen DeJogo, Common, Tom Wilkinson, our producers, Dee Dee Gardner, Jeremy Kleiner, Oprah Winfrey, David Oyelowo, and of course, Miss Ava DuVernay. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, yeah. Is that from the Goonies? Nice. Hey.